This season, the Thursday Club on Fulhamish is sponsored by Green King Sport, where football is more than a game. Green King Sport venues are showing every televised Fulham fixture over the course of the 23-24 season. And with our upcoming game against Manchester United live on TNT Sports, if you don't want to pay £180 for a ticket to go to the game, head to a Green King Sport pub instead. Also this season, Green King have launched their Green King Sport Instagram page, which is home to fan content, deals and competitions throughout the season. They've already given away champions Champions League final tickets and signed shirts as well. So follow them at Green King Sport for your chance to win great prizes and find out about their special upcoming deals. Ladies and gentlemen, it is showtime. Please welcome the team of the Fulhamish Podcast. <laughs> It's the Fulhamish Podcast, your independent voice of Fulham FC. My name's Sammy James. Welcome to the Thursday Club. Today, we'll be looking back at Fulham's 3-1 victory over Ipswich Town in the Carabao Cup fourth round. Into the quarterfinals we go. Also today, we'll preview Saturday's match against Manchester United, both the football on the pitch. And in part two, I'm going to be speaking to Tom Greatrex, former chair of the Fulham Supporters Trust, all about the FST and Fulham Lilies planned ticket price protest. It will be all about uh, where it is, how you can get involved, and Tom giving you reasons why you should get involved. So listen in part two for that. I've got double absence on the Thursday club today. Jack is on an anniversary trip to Venice and Peter Rutzler double booked himself. But I'm joined by a man who was there in Suffolk last night. Mr. Dan Cook, hello. Hi, Sammy. I feel like I'm like the Luke Defuge role of the, the podcast at the moment. Right. It's a hell of a, ro- a hell of a role to take up if that is what your role is going to be, the Luke Defuge role, because he steps in at right centre back and looked like he'd been playing there for years, Dan. He was good. He was good. It was uh, it was nice to see see him get a run out, and it was really nice at the end when Joao Polina came over to the away end and pushed De Fugeros and Devon Tanton in front of the away end so that they could get their special applause for their debuts, which was a really nice touch. I thought at the end. Nice. Well, look, let's um, we'll go through the game in a second, but first, as ever, let's do some three word reviews from last night's win. Dan, what were your favourites? There was quite a, quite a few. There was three sort of genres, I think, a three-word review last night. It was either centred around tractors, Rodrigo Muniz, or Luke de Fugaroles. So we had the Fulham Lilies with over the Muniz as he bagged uh, a goal last night. I was chuffed for him. Vincent Leenda gave us de Fuga rolling into quarterfinals, into quarters. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's about eight words in his three-word review. <laughs> um <laughs> AJ with on tractor Wembley. And finally, we had Chris with Figs Rolls Royce. Oh, very, very nice. Thank you very much for your three word reviews. Well, Dan, it looked like a really fun night up in Suffolk. I was really gutted not to be there, but managed to get myself a good stream um, here at home. And I mean, it was just incredibly comfortable. I think we were all so worried about this Ipswich Town juggernaut because they have been doing so well in the championship. But then again, when I saw them make 11 changes, I was like, I think Ipswich Town are good, but I don't think they're 11 changes and still win the game good. Yeah, I I said it last week as we previewed this podcast after the Brighton game. It was the gulf between the Premier League and the Championship is big at the moment. And we've seen that with the promoted teams that have come up and struggled this season. And the gap, I think, between a Premier League rotated 11 and a Championship rotated 11 is even bigger. Like our squad depth gulfs that of Ipswich. And so when I saw that, I was I was a little bit disappointed by our starting 11 because I thought we'd go stronger. And then I flipped over to look at Ipswich's and I thought, actually this is probably going to be okay. And it really showed. And I was surprised. I was expecting quite a bit of like jeopardy and some nerves and some tension in the game because I really wanted us to win this. And I was worried about what the threats that Ipswich should pose, but really we, we, we cruised it. Like we, we, from pretty much from minute one, it was a real cakewalk. Yeah, it was. And of course it was the goal from Harry Wilson that, that set us on our way. But even then, because of what happened in the last round where Wolves went 2-0 up, I was like trying not to get too excited. And I'm like, maybe this is what Ipswich... And also that Ipswich do seem to be comeback kings this year. So I was trying to be like, this is great, but also don't get too excited because it's really going to hurt when they inevitably come back. Um, but actually it really set the tone. It was, I mean, it was such an easy goal. I was, I was there going like, oh, the camera's obviously just not quite caught the left back there. He'll, he'll come back 
back into shot any moment. Oh, wait, no, he literally is just in acres of space by himself. Good work from Rodrigo Muniz as well in the build-up and a brilliant ball from Bobby and, and well taken by Harry. Yeah, really good. I had a, a like a, a pole in front of me in the away end. So as Bobby went to play that pass, I just assumed there was an Ipswich player behind the pole because I was like, there's no way that Harry Wilson is through on goal here with no one around him. And I looked back at it and... Ipswich just sort of overloaded the ball side when Muniz was holding the ball up and their left back who usually plays at right back seemed to forget about his positioning completely and drifted all the way over and suddenly Harry Wilson had all sorts of room and I think Christian Walton in the Ipswich net panicked as well he saw Harry Wilson bearing down on goal and he just just charged out and it was probably the wrong decision and yeah it was perfect I was chuffed for Harry as well because I thought last night he was overall really quite good, very effective. And we, I think we all want him to get into the goals because if we've got him firing, it sort of eases our centre forward concerns if you've got Harry Wilson chipping in with goals. Yeah, there was a lot of moments last night, Dan, and you talked a minute ago about that golf between the Championship and the Premier League where I really felt like a throwback to two years ago, maybe because it was a lot of similar players as well that, that played in that championship winning side, um, you know, with a few notable improvements clearly, but, and it just, it did just remind me like, my God, like, you know, Ipswich have looked brilliant this year. And yet look, it is a second 11 Ipswich. Maybe if we'd have come up against their first 11, this would have been a much tougher night, but still you just kind of, it, it had that kind of throwback to two years ago, just that feeling of, we're going to win this. Even if you score one, we're going to just go and score another. Yeah. And it, it was a really nice feeling. I, I, I thought it actually before the game, because you're in the, you're at Portman Road, which is a really nice old school ground. It was, my, it was my first time there and it's got like that atmosphere and that sort of feeling behind it of a proper football stadium. And it really did feel like we were back in the championship, you know, people sort of filtering in on a, a random Wednesday night somewhere outside of London. You seem to only get in the championship and it was yeah I, th I thought we we did look like some of those times under Marco in the championship where we went out and we just played teams off the park like I thought Tom Kearney was exceptional last night but to the point where it looked so easy for him like he spent most of the game just sort of in traditional Tom fashion drifting around picking up the ball and distributing but it felt like he walked the entire game and no one got close to him yeah it really he, he just looked like he was I don't know. It looked like he was playing with a bunch of kids at some yeah. at some point. Where even if you like, oh, you're like, oh, is he going to struggle to get that? No, of course he's going to get <laughs> that ball and control it. Or, or like, he just knew where everyone was on the pitch as well. His radar was amazing. He didn't even sometimes have to look. He would just somehow how have have the kind of map of where everyone was um, on the park. Uh, and the first half, Dan, um, after that goal, Fulham didn't create an awful lot more. It was our only shot on target in the first half. There was a nervy moment or two. Rodak, I think, contributed to a... Uh, he had to actually save his own error, really, and actually did very well with the save, but it was very needless from him. And that felt like the only way we were going to get caught out was almost complacency at the back. Yeah, the only time Ipswich posed us any issues in that first half was when we gave the ball away. And I think it's understandable to an extent because that's, if you look at the central three there where you include Rodak and then the two centre-backs, they've never played a competitive game of football together. I Actually, I would imagine they've not played a game of football together, even in pre-season. So that's going to happen. I think there's going to be some nerves there uh, and some rustiness on Rodak's part as well. And I think as easy it is to say, oh, you don't need to take the risk. I think it, in the end, it didn't cost us. And we've got to be consistent with our style of football. So just because... De Fugaroles has come in and just because Rodak's come in doesn't mean we throw our philosophy out the window. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad that Marek didn't get stung by it because I, I really like Marek Rodak and it, it's a shame how good Bert Leno is in a way because it's just there's no way in for him here. And I really hope that he can use his appearances that gets in cup competitions this season to kick on and, and maybe find himself either a loan move or a permanent club next year where he can be number one again because we were speaking about it last night he was brilliant for us across two championship seasons and it's it's a shame that he can't muscle his way into a, being a Premier League keeper mm. but you look at someone like I mean like I know James Trafford's got like a, an enormous amount of potential but like 
actually look you look at it and I think I'd rather have Mary Rodak in, yep. in in goal and, and maybe some of those newer promoted sides I think actually could have done with a bit of Marek because like he's and I think he's learning probably a lot from someone like Bert Leno as well I mean interesting question on Marek and this is a, a little bit um, of a deeper question what do you do if what do you do for the future rounds if I don't know, we've obviously got the quarterfinal against Everton, which we'll talk about in a minute, and, and you know, semis, fi- Carabao Cup final, like the probably the biggest game in Fulham's history, barring the Europa League final. If we ever got, I'm not saying we're there. I'm not saying we're there. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not, I'm not. I'm just, just really putting it out there. I'm just like, because it's obviously you've seen cup keepers. Um, uh, City often use a cup keeper, don't they? Um, Claudio Bravo got a lot of cup. Uh, you know, has played in cup finals and stuff. I don't feel like Fulham are in the position where we can afford to do that, though. No, I agree. I, I think there is a there is a point surely in this competition where it flips to to Leno in goal, but it's it's tough. It's tough because also Marek is like you know it, out of everyone in the squad, it, it's he's up there with the people it would mean most to. He's been with us for forever, mm. uh, and it's a huge thing for him to contribute to a, a cup run Fulham side, but. You know, if, if if you think of the the backlash of if Marek Rodak plays in in any of the next rounds and he potentially contributes to us getting knocked out, that's a really a really tough thing for for Marco to to handle and for Marek as well. So I would probably say, especially when you're considering going to Goodison Park in December, where I reckon they'll be up for it because they've had a lot of glum times and a cup run is probably something that will really cheer up the fan base, uh, depending on where they're at in the Premier League at that point and the points deduction. But it's going to be a, a hostile atmosphere and I would back Burnt Leno to feel a lot more comfortable in goal in that situation than Marek. Yeah, well, we can have we can have this debate later down the line. But now <laughs> let's let's just celebrate um, last night. Um, and, and Dan, in the second half, we kind of... We, we put our foot on the pedal and, and got a couple more goals and Rodrigo Muniz scored. We literally all said after uh, Brighton away, let Muniz cook against Ipswich Town, start him, see what happens. And it's exactly what Marco Silva did. And he took his goal and he took it really well. And it looked like a really fun bit of celebrations. He did the dance with Andreas in front of the away end. He's immensely popular, isn't he? And I, I think it's because we all love a trier. I think that's why it is. I think we love someone that gives a hundred percent and, and, and cares and is fun. And I don't think he's got a bad bone in his body from what we can see on a football pitch. And I think that's why we're all supporting him and loving it. And uh, does this translate into what he can do in the Prem? I don't know. Probably not, but what a, what a great moment for him and a bit of a redemption. Like he had a bleak year last year. He did. He did. He's He's got big cult hero status in this squad at the moment, Rodrigo. And yeah, I think as you say, he's he's a grafter. He puts in in so much work whenever he's on the pitch. And also he just, yeah, he, he seems to enjoy playing football and, and just enjoy being at Fulham. Like even when Fulham tweeted out a video of the players arriving, they're all sort of coming through towards the changing rooms. And then Rodrigo Muniz walks past with like the biggest smile on his face, just because he's seen the camera and he's seen that. Oh, he's like, Oh yeah, I'm playing for Fulham tonight. This is, this is great. <laughs> and, and I love that. I love that sort of enthusiasm. And you saw how chuffed he was to score. And at the end of the game, again, it's, it's like quite special for him receiving that love from the fans, as, as you say, last season was really tough at Borough and the championship season with us wasn't easy for him either because, you know, he was playing in Metro shadow. So for him to get his moment last night was lovely. Uh, and I, I have a strange feeling that it potentially makes him the most likely option to play up front against Man United, but that feels a bit ridiculous. I can't believe that's going to be the case. And I, but it's... That's probably, and, and obviously there's mitigating circumstances considering who we played, but that's probably the best centre forwards performance from any of our three strikers this season. Yeah, I, I agree. And also that I think the, the cameo against Brighton was one of the best centre forward performances that we've seen. And he was so close to doing some incredible things in that game. And I just think if you have the three strikers that we have on the pitch for equal amount of time, I think Rodrigo Muniz gets the most goals. Oh, oh, that's a big shout. 
As in, if, you, if, you, if, if, they, if they all were able to play against Man United for 90 minutes in some myth, hypothetical, hypothetical situation, I just, I'm looking at them and I just feel like Rodrigo Muniz is the most likely to get a goal. Yeah. I, I think Which is not there, saying loads. No, yeah. There's, there's an element of like unpredictability about him as well, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Like sometimes we've questioned like, well, why on earth has he done that? Because he goes a bit rogue sometimes. But definitely I think Raul this season has been predictable and that's low confidence. You know, he's he's just not offered anything that's made it difficult for opposition defences. Carlos Vinicius, I think, started the season okay and then has, has gone cold and, and again, relatively predictable and isn't that, doesn't seem that dangerous. Whereas Rodrigo, I think he does things that maybe older, more experienced strikers don't do. And in some cases, that's a, a bad thing. But in, in games where he's just trying to cause chaos up top, it's great. As you said, against Brighton, he just came on and made it awkward. Uh, and our other two centre forwards haven't done that. Yeah. And and I have always think in that championship season, whenever he played, it was always when he, we desperately needed a goal. He always came on with 15 minutes and he stuck two up top with Mitrovic and it never worked. We've never really al- been allowed to see Rodrigo Muniz in this. The only one game where I, I think we ever really got to see Rodrigo properly was that Stoke game where he was magnificent and he scored a brilliant goal and he, he assisted Carvalho, which could have been his goal. It was all a bit weird, but he was fantastic in that match. And, and I think that it's just something about seeing him in the full 90 minutes and he just see, and I, even against Spurs, like there were some moments where you're like, that's really crap. But there were some also moments where he made Spurs his brilliant defense and people like Mickey van der Ven just be like, who's this guy? What, what's he yeah. doing? I don't know where he's going next. Um, <laughs> and then the, the third goal, Tom Kearney. I mean, it was a keeper clanger really wasn't. It? Awful, but, awful. <laughs> Uh, a brilliant stat I saw from uh, random full of musings on Twitter that Tom Kearney has now scored in every season since he joined the club. Hell of a hell of a record. It's it's, it's incredible. I, I love the 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 heavy lifting as well that's being done by the solitary goals he scored in our two previous Premier League campaigns, the one under Parker and and the one that started with Slavisa. Because it's just that it's that one goal he got in each of those two seasons that's meant that stat keeps going, which I'm, I'm delighted about. And what a, I mean, what a club captain he is. Yeah, sorry, I, I got the Twitter account wrong there. It's uh, random Fulham stuff, at Fulham Random. Tom Kearney continues to score in every season he has played for Fulham since his debut in 15-16. And yeah, as you say, there's now three separate seasons where he's just got the solitary one goal, but always got one just to kind of keep his record going. I mean... He is rapidly approaching testimonial status as well, isn't he? Good old, good old Tom. Um, and and obviously Ipswich got one back. It was a moment actually where I was like, oh my God, this isn't actually on, is it? Because suddenly that crowd woke up out of nowhere and there was 10 minutes left and you just thought of all the miracles that Ipswich have pulled off this year. Don't let this be the the ultimate one. And I was worried for about five minutes and, and then it all calmed down. Yeah. And they also, they'd made a couple of substitutions which saw their more first choice players come onto the pitch. I thought Amari Hutchinson came on and looked really quite good. And I started, yeah, I got a bit, bit tetchy, but it was, yeah, it was comfortable in the end. They had a couple of moments where they probably could have made it three, two. It was a couple of efforts they had that one got deflected wide. Another one went over from just inside the box. And we, we, we rode the storm. And I think actually, as as Ipswich were pushing more and more, we probably were more likely to score a fourth than they were a second because they were so exposed at the back. Yeah, I think I, I, it was never massively of concern, but there were just a couple of moments where I got a little bit shaky, um, <laughs> in, in, in the words of Tom Skinner. Uh, and then, Dan, uh, eventually we got the uh, the quarterfinal draw. I was there uh, nodding off in front of the telly whilst Mark Chapman and co. just spoke some more rubbish for ages. Um, I was just like, come on, get on with it. It was nearly 11 o'clock by the time it, um, it was drawn. Um, and we were in the first tie, Everton away, which when you consider some of the other sides that were in there, like, is okay, but also, I guess maybe when you just look at the logistics of it, a long trip up to Goodison, it always feels far to go up to Liverpool the week before Christmas. It's a tough gig for away followers, but Fulham have got a great record at Everton and I guess it was the best of a bad bunch. Other than obviously the dream draws of the likes of Port Vale, et cetera, or a good home draw, I think Everton away was probably like fourth or fifth best. Yeah. Yeah, it's also, I think, the third time we'll play them at Goodison this calendar year, 
which is quite yeah. nuts because we played them at the back end of last season, the first game this season, and then yeah. we'll play them just before Christmas. So it's um, three long trips and the, the previous two have been great fun. So, <laughs> you know, if we can replicate that, wonderful. But I agree that a home draw, a home draw against Everton is obviously better than an away draw. And the only two other options that were better were Port Vale and Borough. And they've got each other, right? Which yeah. I know we're getting a long way ahead of ourselves, but you've got a potential semi-final in there if we can get over the line at Goodison that, that could be incredible. You know, and and this is, we, we've said it actually for, what, two rounds now? I think it was pretty much after we beat Spurs, maybe more so after we beat Norwich, that there's probably not a better time to win the Carabao Cup. Like the way this has fallen, the way it's shaped up, it's it's really there as a as a potential competition to win, especially when you look at Newcastle getting through last night, having played like a C team. Like that wasn't even a second string eleven from Newcastle, and it's it says heaps about how bad United are at the moment. But Newcastle not taking this overly seriously because they've obviously got Champions League football, so it, it's really opening up. I think like as well get to that semi-finals it's a two-legged semi as well so you kind of like right well it's going to be a big occasion and you've got when you've got two legs in order to kind of get the job done like that's going to be a real occasion if you can get there whatever happens there is a real opportunity now to get to a semi-final that's further than I think Fulham have ever got in the league cup I don't think we've ever got past the quarters so I I just think this is a massive opportunity and yeah with without City in there and now Arsenal as well. So you just keep got big hitters after big hitters going out. Yes, of course, there are some big teams in there and Fulham, I think, are only sixth favourites out of eight, um, which maybe is slightly underplaying our hand a little bit. But I, I, I think there would just be a huge moment. And this Fulham team, I actually think, Dan, are very set up for cups because whilst I think there are big problems with this team and we can't score that many goals, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, we seem to be the new resilience team. We're very, very resilient. We're very, very good at holding on to matches in, in general, barring a few notable exceptions, and staying in games, which is amazing for cup football. Yeah, it's we, we are it's this new counter-attacking style of play. And it's where, you know, you look at some of the successful managers in specifically in, in cup competitions, like you like Jose Mourinho, for example, built on foundations of right we'll try and get a goal. We'll try and win this one nil. Uh, and, and we're happy. That's, that's job done. And we're probably not that negative, but we are, are growing in confidence at the back as well. I think we're looking more and more solid. Calvin Bassey is, is really starting to bed into this team. Now I thought he was good last night. He looked way too good for anything that Ipswich threw at him a couple of times, sloppy in possession again, but really growing into this team. And I think probably it, he's cemented his his place in this team for most of the rest of this season now with how he's performed stepping up to the plate given our injuries so you know i i'd back us in in a one off game you've got to back as a premier league team you've got to back yourself against anyone because you you are in the best division in the country you are capable of beating any team that comes at you and the fact that one of those teams that we could get isn't manchester city just makes that even stronger yeah. Because outside of that, I think we genuinely can beat anyone in the league. Um, I just want to pick up on two players from last night. Um, first of all, Fode Balotore. Um, I, I, I love I love the what's the story Balotore chants. I know Me that too. some people won't, but I just I just I like anything that's original, and I've never heard that before. I, I like anything that's just a bit different and novel. And I um, fair play um, that was. And we I heard it on the telly last night. I was like, well done, well done. Um, I there was a few mixed comments on Balotore. A few people thought that he was a, a big walking mistake, but I thought he was I thought he was excellent. Yeah, I, I thought he was really. Really good. He was. He, it was very similar to his performance against Norwich in the previous round, and I think a couple of times he he is a bit careless in possession, but more so it it's the the issues are more so when it's sort of deeper in our half or on the halfway line. Is a couple of of short passes went went wrong, and a couple of times maybe dived into a challenge and got beaten when he maybe could have just sat off. But what he contributed going forward was superb, and he was. So I think I think the way that he set about getting at that Ipswich team, they would have been fed up of him because he spent genuinely spent ninety minutes overlapping 
Like the, you know, and 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 I know Anthony Robinson does that, but it's felt like even more so from from Balo Torre. Like he never turned down the opportunity. As soon as that ball shifted out left, he just went. And it was yeah. there's like it, it was great to watch. He did the same against Norwich, and th- not all of his crosses were great, but you know, in general, cross success rates are pretty low anyway. You can't expect someone to consistently find their man when crossing the ball, but it's getting into those positions a lot of the time is enough because you're putting Ipswich on the back foot, you're making things happen. And I I thought he was a a large positive contribution last night. And then Lou de Fugerol. I mean, he looked awesome. And my only thought was, is Calvin Bassey must be like, all right, calm down there, mate. Um, Stop playing so well at right centre back um, (laughs) because I need my place back on, uh, on on Saturday. Um, You know, we're here wondering where our right footed centre back is. And um, maybe the answer was here all along. My word, he looked composed and yes. Okay. Again, we have to caveat that it was not a strong Ipswich side, but he just didn't make a mistake. He didn't put a foot wrong all night. I don't think. No, no, he was, he was, he was really composed, which is actually something I was expecting. I was expecting him to be pretty assured in possession. I think that was, I think expected because of what we saw in preseason. And he, he wasn't coming up against like a mug of a centre forward. He was up against Freddie Ladapo, who was their top scorer or one of their top scorers last season in League One. And for a seventeen-year-old to look so assured against a experienced league one slash championship striker. That's bloody impressive. Like that, that's a real big statement. Yeah. He just looks so small out there. That's, that, that is the only thing is that he does look small, but I thought he was really good at knowing he wasn't going to win headers, but making sure that whoever he was contesting with also didn't win it. There was a fair few times when he went up for a header and neither player got ahead on it and Calvin Bassey then sweeped up. And I think that's important. Like if you're not going to win it, just make sure that you make it difficult for your your opposition centre forward. And so that that was really impressive. And he did like he did play safe and he, he didn't try and do anything too risky when in possession. But that's fine. Like, you know, yeah. I think we'd all much rather that he just make his 10, 15 yard passes, use Timothy Castagna, use Calvin Bassey, let them wear the sort of the brunt of the the difficult passes in terms of progressing upfield you just stick to the simple stuff on your debut and I don't think you couldn't have done any better I don't think no uh, a really really hot prospect um, for the future so so well done Luke that'll do for the Ipswich review uh, in part two I chat to former chair of the Fulham Sports Trust Tom Greatrex Part two of the Fulhamish podcast is Sammy here and I'm joined by Tom Greatrex, former chair of the Fulham Supporters Trust, still very much heavily involved and a regular on the podcast as well. Tom, hello. How are you doing? Hi, Sammy. I'm very well, thank you. Um, we're recording this uh, a day or two before the Ipswich game, so neither of us have any clue how it's turned out. But of course, by the time that you're listening to this, uh, it'll be completely apparent whether we have uh, produced a great cup performance or succumbed to the inevitable momentum that Ipswich Town have at the moment. But Tom, we're here to focus on Saturday and the upcoming Fulham Supporters Trust protest um, that is going to be taking place at this match at 12.30 and I just kind of wanted to get your thoughts really on the reasons behind the protest, what's led us to this point and also just how you see things going on Saturday. What are the aims? What are the gold, silver, bronze of potential outcomes from this protest? So I think probably, Tom, worth reiterating again exactly what the plan is for Saturday because people might remember from a few weeks ago what was spoken but might have forgotten some of the details there also might be some people listening to this going what there's a protest I didn't know there was a protest so probably worth us reiterating uh, what the plan is on Saturday. So the the protest essentially has two parts I mean the first is a walk from Bishop's Park congregating uh, by the uh, the tea house and the sort of near where the old bandstand bit of Bishop's Park was um, from 11 o'clock and for 11.30 where we'll walk through to the Stevenage, through to Stevenage Road up to where the barriers are um, and that's to uh, demonstrate some numbers and also we will be doing a quick photo call um, just when we get to that part of Stevenage Road so as many of you as are able to come along um, ahead of the game at 11 o'clock at Bishop's Park and if you've got 
banners or signs or anything you want, bring them with you, although you might not be able to take them into the ground afterwards. And then the second part is uh, a yellow card protest, um, which uh, will be taking part in the 18th minute of the game on uh, Saturday. So we'll be handing out yellow cards um, from 11.30 around the, out the areas outside the ground. Please take one, please take one for other people you sit with. And then on the 18th minute, hold that yellow card aloft. Um, the reason it's the 18th minute is 18% increase in season ticket prices this year. Uh, the reason we're doing it is to draw attention to the fact that this is something which affects people who are in the ground as well as those who are, aren't able to be at the game because they can't afford it. Um, because the trajectory we've seen in relation to season ticket prices is following what we've seen happening in match day prices uh, over recent times. So we want to get as many people as possible holding those cards up on the 18th minute to send a very visual signal uh, on a televised game, a game that will have a lot of attention uh, because of who we're playing, uh, as well as because of the ticket prices for the media, for the club, for the club's owners and for Fulham fans as well to see that we all think uh, that this uh, ticketing model is doing some long-term damage to our fan base. Yeah, I I'm going to play a little bit of um, devil's advocate here occasionally, Tom, mostly because there are people with questions about this protest. There are people that think um, this protest won't be effective or that it's a waste of time or everything else. I think everyone know, <laughs> listening probably knows my feelings on it, but I think it's only right that I try and convey uh, some of the concerns. So I think the biggest concern that I have seen, and I think this is a very legitimate concern to have is what's the point? Will this protest achieve anything for trying to convince the club, the Khans, that they should lower ticket prices? Well, the point is to demonstrate very visibly and very clearly that this is an issue that Fulham fans are concerned about. So if you're somebody who knows somebody who can't go anymore because they can't afford it or can't get tickets, who can't afford a season ticket or have struggled and just about managed to pay the 18% increase this year. But when you look at uh, the trajectory for um, new prices being the season ticket renewal price the following year and going up another 20%, you're not going to be able to afford that. Then if you don't show your support and you don't show, make that visible sign, then what we're doing is letting uh, the club get away with the statements they've made in the past, which is it's only a minority fans who are concerned. If you're not concerned, if you don't think it matters, if you don't think anyone's impacted, then don't hold the card up. But if you are concerned, if you heard Fulhamish last week and you, and you heard the email that you read out from somebody who's in exactly the position of not being able to go anymore, if you know people who aren't being able, to, able to go anymore, you know people who might struggle to afford a season ticket with another 20% increase, you need to be there and you need to hold that card aloft on the 18th minute because otherwise all that will happen is the club will say, well, yeah, Fulham supporters trust, you moan about this and you talk about this and you come up with ideas on ticketing pricing, but you know most people don't mind most people are paying the ticket prices and they're there. That's what we've got to get over. We've got to break the link between the number of people who are there and the perception that means if you're there, you don't care or you don't mind or you don't think it matters or you don't think there are any long-term implications in it. And then I guess the second one, which is kind of related, is why has this particular action been chosen? Because there will be a lot of people who will say, well, you're all still attending the game. You've all still bought a ticket. You've all still contributed. The only way the club will ever listen is if you're hurting their pockets and boycotting the match or boycotting buying things in the stadium, shirts, beers, pies, etc. So why is this course of action being taken and not some sort of uh, initiative that will hurt the club financially? The reason this course of action has been taken is exactly what I've just said. It's because we need to have a very visible demonstration. This is something that people are concerned about. Um, and yes, they might well be there because they've been able to get a season ticket this year. They've been able to um, pay the 18% increase this season. But many of us will know people who haven't been able to do that and people who will struggle to pay another 20% next year. And we know we've got the highest, uh, not just highest season ticket price in the whole of the country of uh, non-hospitality seat. We've got very high prices, the highest prices, I think, charged ever for a match-by-match -match ticket for this particular fixture. If you think it's fine that people are behind the goal are paying in excess of £70 for a ticket in the Hammersmith End or the Putney End, then you haven't got an issue. If you think that's expensive, if you think that has the risk of uh, pricing out uh, our current fan base and limiting the, the extent to which we're able to develop a future fan base, then you need to be able to show that visible demonstration. This isn't um, something that happens in isolation. You know, Sammy, we've talked about this before. 
the Fulham Supporters Trust have been uh, talking to and uh, lobbying and uh, uh, making statements about ticket pricing over the last couple of years, every single time that these different price increases have happened. Um, and part of the club's response is, well, it doesn't matter because it's only you that are saying anything. Most people are fine with it. Now, if you don't think that's a fair representation, a fair reflection, that's why we need to uh, have people taking part on Saturday. And that's why it's really important, as many people as possible, as I say, hold up those, get, take a yellow card from one of the people that are handing them out outside the ground and hold it up on the 18th minute on Saturday. Why, though, wouldn't a boycott or trying to not buy food or drink in the ground or any of those methods of protest work better? Well, in this context, because they're not immediately visible, um, you know, if, you, if you're not buying from the food and drink outlets, for example, or in the club shop, you know, the club might um, eventually feel that uh, in the returns, but you won't see it. So it's about sending a, a visible message. Um, it doesn't, it's not to say that this protest is the exclusion of other things that may well happen and may well develop over the, over the period ahead if we, if we need to. Um, and in terms of a boycott, it's very hard you know, if, if you're, um, and we've seen this from, from fans, uh, groups from other clubs that we've been talking to about this, it's very, very hard to be able to actually get people to boycott a game. Um, it's not as difficult to get people to show they're unhappy about something. And it may come, maybe that we come to other uh, protests, other forms of action, other demonstrations in the future. But we want to send a very clear, visible message to the club, to the club hierarchy and to the media that Fulham fans are not happy with their fellow fans, with our fan base, being charged the prices that are being charged at the moment. And what can we realistically hope out of this? You know, I'd love us to do a protest on Saturday and then half the ticket prices that are go, going forward. I think we can both accept that that feels unrealistic. One thing that I thought was interesting, and I don't know if many people know this, I certainly didn't until very recently, is that Tottenham Hotspur have been strongly protesting about ticket prices and they have just got the club to commit to doing a root and branch review of their ticket prices where they're going to sit down with members of the Supporters Trust, other supporters, and they're going to look at the whole ticketing policy at Tottenham from, from top to bottom. Is that something maybe that actually would be a great success for, for this protest is if we manage to get Fulham to actually sit down properly, listen to fan concerns, or is it actually, no, we want them to really, you know, reduce tickets now? Well, I think there are, there are, three, there are three sort of strands to this. The first is that we need to get the club to acknowledge there is an issue amongst a large proportion of the fan base, as opposed to being able to say it's a minority interest. That's the first thing. The second thing is that we need to also help them get to a plane. Well, they'll do something as similar to what Tottenham have agreed to do, which is, you know, use their um, a bit of imagination and a bit of ingenuity about coming up with a ticketing model that enables uh, there to be higher price tickets for hospitality and some aspects of some parts of the Riverside, for example, but that you also find ways of being able to encourage a future fan base, being able to ensure there are affordable tickets for people who are Fulham fans, you know, particularly behind the goals and in the rest of the ground. Um, and uh, I mean, I suppose the, the third aspect of this, which is, which is, um, really important as well is that we get to a position where uh, the reality of how much money this this is how much difference it makes in the scheme of what Fulham are spending and raising each year is properly appreciated and understood because I think too often people think well that uh, you know if you don't if you don't have the tickets tickets didn't go up 18 percent season ticket holders think prices didn't go up 18 percent then we wouldn't be able to afford you know, the extension of the contract to Jao Polina, for example, or whatever it is, you know, whatever the, 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 uh, the, 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 the sort of calculation that's made that's, uh, that's cited is. In reality, we know that getting to the quarter final of the FA Cup last year, um, as opposed to going out in the third or fourth round, more than accounted for in prize money and TV revenue, uh, the amount of this increase. So it tells you that actually it's not a small amount of money, but in the great scheme of things, it's not that significant. And it's not that significant when you think about the cost of the damage of doing that. And the cost of damage of doing that is that you will have people uh, unable to uh, to get to games. You'll have the uh, you'll lose the opportunity to develop a future fan base that's going to be there in some of the tougher times, which will eventually come because they always do. Uh, and instead, what you have is yes, you can sell the tickets, but you'll have a combination of uh, away fans or tourists in both sense of the word, whether they're international visitors or people who want to see a Premier League game. 
and they'll come to the Fulham against Man United on a Saturday lunchtime. Um, three or four years down the track, if we're still in the Premier League and we're in the sort of bottom half and playing Burnley at home or, you know, whatever whatever one you want to pick, you know, you might find actually that you start to see more more gaps in the crowd because those fi- those fixtures aren't as attractive. And if you haven't got your, your sort of loyal core fan base and that be regenerating by new generations coming through, then actually what you're doing is you're making it much harder for Fulham to be what... Uh, I think everybody wants to be eventually, which is a sustainable football club rather than a sustainable model. Yeah, I'm just going to break back out of devil's advocate mode for for a second and break back towards my own personal thoughts on this. This is a complex issue. It is not a simple case of just reduced tickets. I think like we all accept that we want Fulham to be financially sustainable and to find income sources where they can. I think we all support Fulham having more revenue in order to do what they want and, and sign the players they want to sign, etc. If we want to have an official florist and an official sports drink partner, and if we want to charge lots of money for hospitality, I think we're all mostly supportive of that as long as the way of making money is is moral and, and acceptable, etc. But we need to find a way in order to, for big games, let loyal Fulham fans who are proper, proper Fulham fans get access to tickets at an affordable rate, you know, in the Hammersmith end, we shouldn't be having to charge much more than 50 quid. We should be allowing fans that just happen to live in different parts of the country. And we should be using things like loyalty points in order to make sure that the tickets for big games are at least being given at the first refusal to people who you would quote unquote call loyal Fulham fans. And then secondly, for those less attractive games, games like Sheffield United, where tickets were £71 in the Hammersmith end. That is not a way to grow a fan base. They are games, you know, the the, the newly promoted clubs, the kind of teams that you would class as category C are where we should be growing our fan base with, with cheaper, more approachable tickets so that we can encourage people to become Fulham fans over time. They get an exposure to it and then they want to come again and again and again. But also, I think, Tom, it is right that Fulham should be able to find a way as well of, as you say, there being some ticket ve- options available for people that happen to be in London um, next l- next Saturday and are willing to pay absolute top dollar to go and watch Manchester United. I think that, like, it seems like with the club's approach, that they either do one or the other. Like, it's such a blunt instrument. Both things, in my opinion, are possible. And that's why I think getting the club round a table listening to fans, not just the supporters club. Let's get a diverse range of Fulham fans. Let's get people like Grace who sent in that email in front of people that are decision makers at the club as well to just make and outline these issues that there are ways that we can all win here. Look, you know, the Fulham Supporters Trust exists to to represent Fulham supporters and the Fulham fan base. And amongst uh, the people who are members, you've got a, you know, a huge diverse range of people of different ages, different income levels, different um, lengths of time supporting the club. But they're all united by one thing, which is that they support Fulham Football Club. And however they've come to Fulham Football Club, they value it as an important part of uh, their lives, their identity, what they choose to do with their their time and, and money. Um, and we should be encouraging and nurturing that, as should the club. And if we can play a role in helping the club better appreciate that than they have done today, it's not that these arguments that we've been making are new, um, but I think that where we've got to help try to get to is a point at which the club will actually properly engage. And by the club, I mean the people, whether they be in uh, Florida or Mottsford Park, that do the spreadsheets to understand that this is more than just numbers. This is people, and it's the people that are the heart of what sustains your club in the medium to long term, rather than this week, next week, and the rest of this season. Um, and there are plenty of examples of clubs at the top level, at all levels, that use a, have a degree of imagination and uh, flexibility about how they structure their different ticketing approaches. Uh, it's not beyond the wit of man or the wit of Fulham or the wit of Alistair McIntosh to come up with models uh, appropriate to Fulham that cover those bases. Up to now, there's basically been a refusal to do it. The reason there's been a refusal to do it or to consider it in any sort of degree of seriousness um, is because, as we saw um, Previously, when the season ticket prices were held, you get a soft soap interview with Shane Khan in a, in a newspaper where he says, well, well, you know, I pay high grocery prices too, and actually we've sold all the tickets, so it doesn't matter. Now, that is a simplistic misreading of the situation. 
it, it doesn't appreciate the medium to long term damage that that approach is doing. Um, and the club really need to properly realise this. And that's what Saturday's about. And that's what the ongoing work that Fulham Supporters Trust, on behalf of all Fulham fans, has been doing and will continue to do uh, to try to get to a place where we have a much better position. And if where we, could, where we get to or could get to is something similar to what um, Tottenham have announced in the recent past, a proper thorough review of ticket pricing, match day season tickets, uh, issues around loyalty points and how that's best distributed so we can get the best bits of all of those different considerations. We're not uh, adversely limiting the opportunity to earn revenue, but we're also appreciating and understanding the need to build a fan base for the future. Then that's the place that actually is in everybody's interests. And it saddens me, frankly, that um, after more, a couple of years of, of different ways of engaging on this and coming up with alternative arguments, presenting detailed options that so far all the Fulham Football Club have been able to say as well, you've heard what you said, but we're going to put the prices up anyway. Um, uh, I think we need to move beyond that because if we don't move to beyond, beyond that, I think the damage that's potentially going to be done is significant and also it adversely affects the relationship between the club and the fan base and that's not where you want them all to be pulling in the same direction. So it's in everybody's benefits, everybody's interest to one, take part in the protest on Saturday. They're peaceful, respectful, but pointed uh, uh, protest. That's what, we're, that's what we've designed and want people to join in on. And two, for the club to properly engage and come up with a much better way of doing things for the future that suits everybody. Perfectly put there, Tom. And uh, I think that is it, really. It's, it's hugely simple. The message is clear of what is happening on Saturday. There'll be a meetup in Bishop's Park next to the tea house from 11, a walk to the cottage at 11.30. If you can't join or don't want to join in that, pick up a yellow card from volunteers outside the cottage on the Stevenage Road, hold it up on 18 minutes and together a visual, a big wall of yellow will go a long way. It will be picked up by TNT Sports. It will be beamed across the world. And that is the idea and the ambition with this. Um, the Fulham Supporters Trust are looking for volunteers to take part. So not just to turn up um, at 11 or 11.30. They want people to be able to hand out flyers, etc. Handing out um, seven, 8,000 flyers within the space of about half an hour it takes an awful lot of manpower. So if you have some time beforehand and you want to get involved, turn up basically. And I mean, obviously you can let the supporters trust know, but also just turn up and, and offer your hat and, and offer your help and your services on, on Saturday it will go a long way. And, and hopefully a message can be sent to the club. Um, Tom, thanks so much for your time today. And, and uh, let's, let's fingers crossed, hope it goes well on Saturday. One final point, if I can, just very briefly, which is to say, sure. um, I want to uh, also recognize the support from not just Fulhamish, but a whole range of different fan media channels associated with Fulham behind this, because it's really important that this isn't seen as something which is just the Supporters Trust. Obviously, Supporters Trust exists to represent everybody, but we want all the Fulham voices behind it, and that's been good to see. And it also means those people who might be, you know, critical of the Trust in the past or, or you know, questioning whether this is really worth it. Look, it's not the responsibility of the Fulham Supporters Trust to make this work. It's a responsibility of all of us. We've all got to join in and all be part of it. Because uh, if we don't, then we're not going to get into a much better position. So, look, thank you to Fulham Mission and everybody else for getting behind this. Let's make sure we get as many Fulham fans behind this as possible on Saturday. Expertly put, Tom. And uh, thank you for your time and uh, see you at the weekend. Thanks, Sammy. Part three of the Fulhamish podcast is Sammy here back with Dan Cook. Thank you very much to Tom for uh, talking through all of Saturday's plans and hopefully see as many of you there as possible before the game. Dan, let's look ahead to the actual football on the pitch on Saturday, 12.30 PM kickoff against Manchester United. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a funny time to play United. They are mid mid peak chaos right now. And whilst I think that chaos kind of always consumes Manchester United, it feels particularly chaotic right now. They lost three nil to Newcastle. They lost three nil to Manchester city. I mean, they're just all season. I feel like even when they've won, been really unimpressive. You know, you look at the win that they got uh, against Copenhagen. Well, literally a, a missed penalty away from, from drawing and going out the champions league. Basically they were, they labored to a win at Sheffield United. They got two very late goals against 
Brentford in a kind of mad injury time, really. Um, lost at home to Palace, lost at home to Galatasaray. I, I, I look at them all season and I'm, and I'm struggling to find any win that they had while being like, wow, Man United really were brilliant in, in, in that game. And in some ways I'm like, this is the, a bit like Chelsea last year. You're like, you'll never get a better time to play United. But then again, like I just have this feeling that we're going to somehow give them the win that they so desperately need. Yeah. I, I don't even know if it's the win that they so desperately need. I think it's more so like it will be, it just screams a win that papers over cracks at United. Like they, 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 they pull out these results every now and then where you think, Oh my God, this, this is it. This is, you know, whichever insert manager name here that they've had over the last eight years, but this is their, if they lose this, that's them done. And it's just, it was quite a good time to play them last season as well. I thought, and we played, I remember that game so well because it was the last game before the world cup. And it was such yeah. a horrible way to go into it because we were brilliant. Like it was one of our, potentially one of our best performances of the season. We were exceptional and, and we just got stung in the last minute, but the opportunities there, like as you say, you know, we'll never get a better chance. The the opportunity is is really there for us, and I think the key is to go out and try and make something happen early on, because you're going to have travelling United fans who, I think, at the moment are expectant and almost almost want these bad performances because they know that the more this happens, the more it has to instigate change within the club, like at all levels. It's not just a a playing personal issue. It's not just a managerial issue. Like there's just like huge issues at the club in general. And it's almost like they're going to have to hit rock bottom for things to improve there. And so if we can get on top of them early, you know, if we can try and get an early goal, then it gets really difficult. Then they're panicking and they've got players in that squad who have got real low confidence at the moment. I think we've got to try and exploit that. I mean, you look at this team and you're like, my God, this this is not a team befitting of the status of Manchester United. Like Harry Maguire and Johnny Evans at, at centre-back. And look, there are obviously is quality all over his pitch as well. But like, Diogo Dallo, like how has he played 120 times for Manchester United is, is beyond me. Lindelof at, at left-back. Um, there are, you know, th- there are good players in here. Like Marcus Rashford is a good player on his day. So is Bruno Fernandes. Obviously Rasmus Hoyland was, was an incredible strike for Atalanta last year. Casemiro appears to be injured. I don't think that's as big a boost for us as it was last year when he was suspended for the FA Cup game. That really was a big boost. He's been pretty woeful this year. But you think, I'm like, well, we should win the midfield battle. If you've got Polina against this midfield, we should win. We should get lots of joy in the wing. And even though Fulham can't score goals... I, I think that like we we've come up against better defenses for for nearly all of our games this season uh, than than these lot. Like it's incredible how much they spent four hundred million pounds since last year. It's it's obscene, and you and you go through that squad at the moment, and you still think that they're a long way off it. Like you, as as you said, you listed out the players in that squad that you know players that probably United fans at the end of last season wouldn't have expected to see starting games this season. Uh, they, they've spent money, but they haven't really progressed. And I think it, you add in there as well, you know, I think I think Andre Onana is a very good goalkeeper, but again, that penalty save maybe I think boosts his confidence, but he's got a clangor in him at the moment. And and he's he's shown it on more than one occasion this season where he's let one in that he shouldn't or playing up from the back, which he's very good at. He is still capable of an error. And so... We just got, as I said, we've got to fly out. We've got to make it difficult, and it, it is it is there for the taking. But it also does really scream like Mason Mount ninety fourth minute in off his ass to get what is what would be his, what his first goal for the club. Like it, it's it's yeah. one of those really annoying things that you can just sort of see it coming. <laughs> And I guess that's because we're scarred from particularly last season, right? Where three times I think we went into games against Manchester United and we lost three times to them. And in theory, you could make a case for Fulham should have won all of them. We should have won the game at home where it was obviously that last minute winner from Garnacho and Fulham had chance after chance after chance. We know we should have won the FA Cup game. We've talked about that more times than, than I can care to. And I still think I'll look back at that as top three low Fulham moments. Mm. in years to come. Like, I really was so 
heartbroken by what happened that day. And even the last day of the season, as much as it didn't flipping matter, we should have been 2-0 up had we had a striker that could score a penalty. <laughs> so, and, and each time you've lost. So I guess that's why, if anyone's listening to this, it's maybe a neutral or like going like, why are you guys so negative? Why are we necessarily going to lose? It's just because those scars of last year are still sore because... I, th- I think it extends beyond well. last year. I think it extends beyond last year as well. They're like United have been for my whole life, your whole life, this team that just gets results. And, you know, it's, it's weird because whilst they are awful at the moment, it seems to, they always seem to do it against teams that aren't Fulham. <laughs> like they, they seem to pick up those results as well. But you look at, you know, I'm sure Brentford fans will be looking and they've actually, they've got a pretty good record against United, all things considered. But you look at what happened to them this season at Old Trafford. And that is probably the archetypal Manchester United home win, two goals in injury time, having not laid a glove on the opposition for the whole game. And a player who's been cast out of this squad and then brought back into it, playing in holding midfield, scores both goals. And you're like, that is just Manchester United. That's what they do. And they've always got that in them. And and so that's, that's obviously the worry. Uh, but I think if you took everything out of it, like if you took all of our trauma against them and how we expect things to go and took a completely neutral point of view. I think a lot of people would be having Fulham as, as the, the more likely to win this game, like an outsider's perspective on this. I think we are the, 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 the favorite, you know, it, people are looking at what United are doing at the moment and they're so far off it. And we are in a decent place. We're not as good as, as we would like to be within the fan base, but I think, Externally, people still look at Fulham as now a stable Premier League mid-table club. And it's it screams one of those where, yes, Manchester United should always win, but actually maybe Fulham are favourites here. Yeah, and you look at the Fulham's position in the table as well. We're still kind of like nicely above that real like dross zone. Um, but we've got Villa next week. I think that's possibly up there with toughest games of the season. I, I'd say, I honestly say it's about top three, the way that Villa are playing at Villa Park right now you could get a win here if you could get a win it would be I think really important and there's still lots of difficult fixtures to come after that yes there's a Wolves game that we might win but Wolves are resurgent Liverpool's not easy there's there's difficult games listed in we need to pick up wins where we can and and if there is a walking wounded like Manchester United are right now I think Fulham have to take the opportunity and uh, and, and and seize upon it yeah I, th- I think it's something we did really well last season was when we we look forward. You always look at like the next five to eight fixtures, don't you? And you start to think, right, how many points can we get out of this? And in those tough runs, we'd look at it and we think, well, we're going to really struggle to pick up points here. But every time last season, we managed to pluck a result out of somewhere that we maybe weren't expecting. And that is along the lines of picking up a point at, at the Amex. You know, stuff like that, where I think most Fulham fans had that down as a loss. And when you come into the season, you're looking at this game at United as a loss. But if you can just chunk in with these bad runs if you can just pick up results that you weren't expecting to it really eases because I think in the Premier League whilst we were fantastic last year at winning games against the the bottom five it's being able to consistently pick up points is also what keeps you clear of that jeopardy and which just eases any concerns because you're always if you go through a run where you, you don't win any in five you start to look down it's picking up points here and there that just keeps that train chugging along. I think it's important. Yeah. Uh, Dan, from a Fulham perspective, um, what do you think we'll do in this match? Do you, do you really think it's Rodrigo? I, my, my money, if I was going to actually have to put some money on who starts up front, it would be back to Vinicius. Yeah. I, 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 I think if, it, if you gave me the choice between Raul and, and, and Carlos Vinicius, I think Vinicius is probably the most likely at the moment. And it's really tricky because I, I do see them as, as better footballers, you know, just like as a, as a collective, as a, an actual footballer at then Rodrigo Muniz. But it is really hard to ignore Muniz's contributions when you're looking at, at two other strikers in the squad who have, have barely contributed. Rodrigo Muniz in what he played, what, 70 minutes last night, 30 minutes at Brighton. So in a hundred minutes of football, he's done more than those two potentially put together across this season so far. But Carlos Vinicius 
showed us last season against he did it against Manchester City, didn't he? The game before his his ability to pop up with a goal, he's probably still the most likely in terms of being presented with a chance to put it away. I think Raul's confidence is on the floor. I, I think he probably almost needs a spell out of this team at the moment because he looked so frustrated even last night when chances weren't falling his way. Otherwise, I think outside of that, most of the team probably picks itself. I think we know what the the goalkeeper and back four situation is going to be. As good as Luke de Fugros was, he's not going to start against Manchester United. Polina comes back in. I guess there's a question on who plays alongside Polina. I don't know what you think. Yeah. Well, I think he'll, I have a feeling he'll pick Reed again. Me um, too. Maybe, maybe that's as simplistic as Lukic played most of the game against Ipswich. Um, and I don't know why, I've just got a feeling that this, this is, I, I don't think Harrison Reed did brilliantly against Brighton, but I feel like this game against Man United, something, something in my bones tells me this is a game that, that Harry, will, uh, Harry, Harry Wilson, Harry Reed <laughs> will, uh, will do well. Yeah. I mean, but then again, like, I mean, is it, what is it? A Wobi in the 10? I think I would like to see that. I think, again, I thought Andreas Pereira was good in spells last night, but he showed, again, time after time, why he can be so frustrating because he picks the ball up on the edge of the area, we're driving forward and he overhits a pass, like like not even slightly, like astronomically overhits a pass straight out of play. And it's just so frustrating that he's got, got that in his locker so consistently, mm. whereas... I thought Awobi came on last night and he just offers something different. Like he was playing out left last night and he's still, I don't know, the, the ball ends up at his feet and you get excited. You feel like he's going to do something. I, I, opposition defences drop off when they see him coming at them. I, I, I think he probably should come in. I thought he was brilliant against Brighton. I'd like to see him in that 10, 10 role again. Um, and I guess the only flip side is that we've all had our issues with Willian this season. And with the effort that Andreas Pereira gives you out of possession, if you play him in the 10 and Alex Awobi takes up the left wing slot, it is something we could also maybe see. But I don't know. I think, I think again, Marco like, still I trusts Willian. Yeah. And I think I'd, like, against Dallo, I think I'd like to see Willian have a go. Even if it's like, the only thing I've I, I found with Willian is I don't mind starting Willian, but if he's not working after 50 minutes, 60 minutes, take him off Marco. Like just, just, just accept that it's like it's fine. I think we can all forget. I think I think William's one of those that in the early stages of a match, he's you know, his ball control is brilliant. He he maintains the tempo well. He, he's but I think it's a if William's not working, don't take him off after eighty. Take him off after sixty and and switch it up. You've got options yeah. now because of Awobi's left um, wing ability. You've got options with which to switch it up. So I just say take those a little bit earlier. Um, yeah. And then, the only other thing on on the yeah. on the right, yeah, that's I think what we're going to. okay, yeah. Well, I think it poses an interesting question because if if it's Regulon at left back for United, you'd maybe be more tempted to play Bobby to to deal with that more adventurous fullback. If it's Lindelof, I I, I don't think we need to to mitigate against an overlapping fullback. I think you maybe go right or like full barrel, you, you play Harry Wilson and you think, well, you're not going to need to track back as much. I think that's, that's the, and, and Marco's going to have to take, make a judgment call there because if, if United are playing Dallow on the right and, and they are trying to stay stable defensively, you play, you know, a more traditional fullback who tucks in and forms a back three when United have got the ball, then I think that works better for Harry Wilson. He has to do less work out of possession and can affect the game in the final third. But if they're going to go both fullbacks bombing on, then as we've seen with Bobby Reed, he's brilliant at, at trying to support his fullback. So I think it's that's a really tricky one for me. The problem but I, is you don't know who you don't know who it's going to exactly. be. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, but I, I kind of I kind of like us to say sod it. Let's 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 go at them. I thought Harry Wilson was really good last night, and I really want him to get a longer run in this team because we keep on thinking that he's just on the verge of becoming championship Harry Wilson again. Like he just one game away. And like we saw it in the international break, he scored two and we're like, Oh, he, he's, he's back. He's back. And then he wasn't. And then last night he looked more like himself again. So I'd kind of like to see him get a bit more of a run. Yeah. I mean, I mean, Bob's played on the left yesterday and I, yeah. I thought was, was, was okay. Um, yeah. I, I really like Bobby in the middle, but it's just such a congested 
I, I want Bobby everywhere. I like I want <laughs> Bobby on the pitch, but there's no one position which I go for Bobby. Oh yeah, give him that position because I'm like, oh no, but then I don't want to lose a Wobi or I don't want to lose Willian or whatever. I, I find it so hard, but all I know is I want Bobby on the pitch. And yeah. and now it looks like Rodrigo Muniz has taken his spot up front. It's a nightmare <laughs> for him. Wherever he wherever he picks out Bobby, uh, you get someone else kind of supersedes him. But yeah, we we all love a team of Bobby Reeds. Um that'll do for the podcast today. Um Dan, what would you like to go with as your favorite of the three word reviews for the pod name? I, I would have loved to have gone with Vincent Leander's De Fuga rolling into quarters, but that's I don't think that's three <laughs> words. So I think AJ's on tractor Wembley. I think that's perfect. I like that yeah, one a lot. Really, really good. Well done, AJ. Thank you for your pod name. Thank you for all your three word reviews. And thank you for listening today. Uh, I will be back hosting the Post Manchester United podcast. So that should be out Sunday evening, Monday morning. Uh, and then the Thursday Club, which Jack is going to be hosting, uh, will be out this time next week, previewing our game against Aston Villa. Uh, Fulham have moved into the quarterfinals of the Carabao Cup. The dream lives on. I haven't mentioned it smugly yet. Uh, we're getting we're two games away three games away I guess if you include the two legs from the uh, from my prediction coming true Dan thank you for coming on today oh, it's a pleasure cheers Sammy and have a great weekend come on you whites come on you whites